And we are live for a new episode of League DFS. We are live streaming today and, you know, we'll have a special guest here, at, which I'll introduce in a moment, uh, guys. But today I'm, I'm just running a new schedule, trying something different out. Hopefully you'll be able to jump on the chat, kind of talk. You'll find us on, or you'll find this video on my Twitch uh, channel. My name is Primetime Chris Chung, and today it's, yes, it's in the morning now. Really weird. For me to be recording but i invited ryan captain morgan dfs on twitter how are you doing this day ryan i'm good thanks for having me on yeah absolutely man it's been a while you know we got chatting at the beginning of this year when you were jumping on to league of legends scene trying to understand the game but uh man it's 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 really about time that i got you on to talk about uh, <laughs> dfs with me man no problem. I'm happy to be here, man. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and we're hoping to dig in a little bit more into your knowledge, what you've learned. Uh, but before we get there, tell people a little bit about yourself. This is the first time on the show, and um, you know I've watched you kind of get involved and just get really into this uh, the esports scene. Yeah, I uh, I'm a sports addict, I guess. So I've been playing regular DFS for four or five years now and then I got into uh spreadsheets and things like that I, like the data side of it and I just started trying to find out any sport that I could use it and one of my one of the members when I worked at DFS Karma started telling me about League of Legends DFS and I jumped in and tried to figure out a way to do that and then I started watching it and I got hooked so now I I started really looking at it from the DFS side and how to win more money <laughs> and then uh it snowballed into now I'm staying up till 2 a.m. because I'm West Coast <laughs> trying to watch in Korea games. And yep. uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going anywhere soon. So <laughs> now, now I'm hooked. That's awesome, man. And, um, <clears throat> and so you were involved in other <clears throat> DFS sports in the beginning, right? Uh, which one was yeah. your uh, favorite sport before, you know, you know now that we'll, we'll consider League of Legends your best Basketball, I uh, was I'm pretty good at, and I would watch that a lot. Um, and then uh, golf is probably the one that I was best known for before esports side of it. My partner at your DFS playbook, AP, we both kind of started talking during NBA season, and then we started producing content together for PGA, and that's kind of how we both uh, started making our name. That's awesome, and. Uh, you'll continue to have success in those areas. I've seen you guys post how um, your strategy, the discussions, how it led to pretty successful for a lot of your followers and um, praying that you continue to grow. And guys, I will post the description of how you can find um, Ryan's work and um, your uh, partner's work <clears throat> on the show description. So you guys, if you want to expand beyond just League of Legends, you can head on there. So uh, before we move on to the next segment, um, this is a show that's presented by The Game House. Please visit our website for your <clears throat> information about traditional sports and esports as well. We have a lot of amazing writers who are um, involved in the scene to discuss about teams, discuss about uh, roster changes and challenges with that. Um, but this show specifically is DFS focused. Now, Ryan, um, Getting into this, uh, the League of Legends, when did you start taking this seriously? When did you go, want to go beyond just dabbling it that you wanted to make it a uh, something that you can um, understand? And what was the difference between League of Legends and your traditional uh, sports? Uh, I think there's actually a lot of similarities, which is why I kind of got got hooked. Like, uh, in coming in as a as a newbie, I started basically in January, so a little after the spring split started, I had uh, I had seen the games on DraftKings and then didn't really bother with them. But there's a member in that uh, I was kind of talking to, and he was really into it and started just telling me about it. And I start I watched a couple games, and just the nonstop action. Once you get a couple minutes in, uh, uh, basically like I came back from. I was younger and playing some World of Warcraft, so it was kind of like a mix between the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, totally reminded me of that. I got really interested in it, and then I started figuring out what the strategy behind it was. Um, and I love data, so I started trying to find sources for that, like 
gamesoflegends.com and Oracle's Elixir. And once I knew we were there that, I started building spreadsheets and it went on from there. Yeah. So talk a little bit about um, being able to understand the game itself and the correlation between being able to be a good uh, DFS player. What did you learn by playing the game? Uh, I just recently actually started playing the actual game. That's so right. Watching it for a while, kind of trying to figure it out. But thanks to guys like you and then Jelati, the guys at the Gold Card Podcast, like they've all been pretty cool about me messaging them and asking, like, why did they do this? Why did they do that? And then I finally got a, a computer that was fast enough to run it. <laughs> and uh, now, I'm, now I'm in there, and I understand it a lot more. But I think the, it's just the fact that it, like, it's the whole team um, it actually reminds me a little bit like soccer, where mm -hmm. if you plug players in so when they do like the roster swaps and things like that, you can actually kind of see how things like kills and assists might get redistributed. So when I'm look, when I'm researching, I'll see like you know if this guy if the, if I expect the team to do like 20 kills and this guy averages like five, then I I can make the math put like 25 percent of those kills to that guy. So you can kind of from a DFS side of it, you can kind of do some basic math and figure out like where the points could come from. And once I knew that, I started watching as much as possible and digging into all this, the data and trying to figure out how I could predict, try and predict who's going to win. Awesome. And uh, those, all those factors, you were able to piece it together. And once you got that going, your model sounds like something that uh, it's been uh, worked for you pretty well throughout this season. Uh, have you noticed any difference between the different regions, the different game slates that you play? Yeah, I'm I'm actually usually better at the one game mm -hmm. uh, region, so LEC and LCS are better at. Uh, I think like your, yourself and uh, Charlie and John, those guys, they're usually at the three gamers because they have a better understanding of the non, like the macro as far as the micro stuff that I look at a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. It's easy for me to try and predict 1v1 who's going to maybe come on top. But when you have all these other factors, like it could go 2-1, two, two and one. it could go 2-0. and oh, and then, um, That's a little harder for me to always predict. Mm -hmm. So for the for those ones, I usually just kind of get a little strange and, and uh, do more GPP style and, and pray for upsets. But LEC and, L and LCS, I can... Uh, I can see the one-on-one -on -one matchups a little more uh, black and white. Yeah, and that absolutely makes sense. And that's part of the reason, and you're, you're completely correct. Uh, when I'm working on DFS, the, it's, I, on the one hand, I would like to say it's easier to kind of figure out the best of one kind of match because there is certain predictability in terms of outcome and how to construct the roster and uh, it adds a lot of uh, factors once it becomes a best of three or best of five which noting this this will be s something important that we talk about because uh, on the upcoming playoffs and once we hit the world stage yeah. there's a lot more of that um but uh how i guess <coughs> i guess your model building and my experience have um agreed on that that it's much um simpler not easier i wouldn't say because upsets no. still happen and definitely <laughs> yeah i think you have more potential for upsets on 1v1 mm -hmm. but i i think that you can get a general idea of what should happen mm -hmm. in a 1v1 and then it's kind of it's it's actually better easier to strategize because it's okay if you're praying for an upset they only have to win one game they don't have to win two like they do in uh in korea or china so it's a lot like you don't have you have a smaller sample size so that reminds me of baseball where every, every day like the guy's gonna get four or five chances to hit a home run and if he doesn't you're screwed but he could just strike out four times and then hit one home and you're safe yeah and that's kind of where the lec and lcs are where if you know like we had we just had fox win finally and it was <laughs> like like i i i had seen him all year they could they could lay down damage. They just couldn't do anything as a team. It's mm -hmm. like I just praying for one time for them to win, and they finally did. And this one was probably a win that we we thought like they have a shot at it because the previous wins that right. they have this split was random. They beat TL. Right. They beat C9. It's like 
how? You're asking yourself, yeah. how does that happen? Uh, uh, but well, well, yeah, go ahead. That's just the C9 troll job. <laughs> that's uh, that's true. Yeah. And that's a TL derp because they were ahead the whole game and then just decide to throw last minute. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, and with that said, that's why this show, we try to focus more on the LEC, LCS uh, perspective. I think it's better for cash, at least for me, to kind of pinpoint those things down. Uh, Definitely. Noting that, uh, is there anything we forget to mention when it comes to strategy? Oh, I did. I do want to talk a little bit about this year uh, and uh, and the, the experience for you. Have you been playing League of Legends before this year? Like no, the DFS? No. no, not yet. I mm-hmm. no, no. And my the closest thing I knew about this game was another game called Vainglory, mm-hmm. and there's no DFS for it. But that's right. the closest like the co- most correlation i had to mm-hmm. when i started watching okay no problem but uh I'll, your your knowledge here will be valuable then because you're coming in with a fresh eye so before this year um there was very little thought given to this sport by DraftKings, but through our feedback through the uh, involvement over the uh, last year they've decided to finally implement some changes to bring about a fresh approach to the game mainly they took out the two flex spots that we used to have and they added a captain spot instead, making this a little bit more so uh, like a showdown slate in the NFL. Right. Um, so with the captain spot, how has your roster construction um, process kind of formulated? <coughs> uh, well, mid and ADC are always priority, mm-hmm. um, it, depending on the team, but they're always going to be the ones that you can guess are going to be in the middle of all the team fights and have the best chance of racking up kills. Um, the one thing I valued more now than I did even in Spring Split is the support. Like knowing how big a difference there is between Zazal and Core JJ and everyone else is huge because I I kind of want to put times when I want when I have to put a support in the captain spot, but those are the two guys where I have no problem doing it. Yep. So just being able to learn which teams in which players actually can pay off and a huge gap it's not just in the, the quality of the teams but in the individual players and like the type of upside they have even though their roles aren't typically the the carries or the ones that are going to be the big point earners absolutely and it's been in the beginning it's been a little challenging to pinpoint the support uh, role in reality versus dfs right because support generally were known to be not to be involved in the solo kills or they don't rack up those which right. is the points that we want and so everyone is mass uh, so focused on mid and adcs but support has this assist thing going on for them and like you said right the special ones will hit a bonus will hit the bonus right right um the double if the double if card jj combo has been money for a long time absolutely. and it will continue to be <laughs> Unless they decide to like lose randomly to Fox, um, we'll talk about that. Jeez. <laughs> uh, but yes, so typically we we can figure out, like I said, because of these best of ones, you know the stack that the combo of um, the ADCs and their support. If you can find the right combo, you'll come up ahead. You'll you'll set a high floor every time. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, another change that was brought, and you probably experienced this, the spring and the summer, between those t- the two period, DraftKings decided to kind of mess with the salaries. In the spring, you kind of you could have seen like if the team is priced at a uh, that is the most expensive, you can automatically uh, figure out that the top jungle mid ADC support all will be the most expensive. But during the sp- uh, summer. We begin to see that they are adapting to it. What what is your sense of this adaptation that DraftKings is doing, and how does that change some of your approach to the game? I think it helped me because uh, part of what I what I do with the data side is I also have like an optimizer, so it's mm-hmm. a lot easier for me to find value now. And it actually I think it does better because I think before if there was a tight matchup for like a team liquid, mm-hmm. the whole team was priced down. Yep. 
and like if it was TLC nine or something like that. Mm-hmm. And now there there's a lot more variance. So there's more strategy in building it. And it's a lot more like a tradi- like some of the tra- traditional sports where you can find fu- if a guy's just constantly racking up numbers, then he's gonna always be expensive as opposed to before, like you said, where he could be super underpriced for almost no reason at all. Mm-hmm. But the fact that his matchup's a little tougher. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, the point. You hit it right on the head. For me, we are paying more atten- uh, attention to more to the value, the salary points value that a player can give you rather than just looking at matchup, figuring out who will win, and just stack them as much as possible. So um, I know my I've been a little bit stubborn, and I've ended up paying for that this year because I still went with the old system where I'm trying to get as many players of the same team in my lineup uh, does this salary system make you more towards being okay? I will just pick the best value at a certain position and just stack up the the team that will actually win. Or do you still try to fit players around whether they win or lose? So I do the I do the playbook and I do the templates for for our website, your DFS playbook. And mm-hmm. what I always do for our cash stuff is I approach it the way I kind of do baseball, where I'll find the teams that I'm most confident will win Mm -hmm. and i'm okay picking if they're all kind of like i think equal win probability i'm okay picking from up to like maybe three teams Mm -hmm. but i try to still keep it at two because you still want that correlation Mm -hmm. even though the numbers might say the mid lane or the adc is supposed to get it you could have a random spence garen or licorice pop-off game and you don't want to be the one guy that didn't stack that that last position so I think especially in cash, it's still really good to stick to two teams, maybe three, mm-hmm. if you want to go like a four-two-two. Two. Mm-hmm. Um, but in GBPs, I get a little weird. I might go, you know, double a four G, and then do three from another team, and then t- the last two from another team or something like that. Yeah. Or I've I've had up to four teams sometimes, wow. just depending on how confident I am in the wins. <laughs> if you think it's going to be an all an all favorite slate, mm-hmm. then. Why not mix it up? Because everybody's going to be on the same favorite, so yeah. you got to find an edge somewhere. That's that's a great point, and uh, that's a little preview of what we're about to head into. But so your uh, that that sounds interesting, and you kind of need that, right? In those large field GPPs like the eight dollars, the quartered arcade, or even the which one is another large one? Sometimes the the one uh, the, the three dollar one dollar and the three dollar yeah. 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 Those are more or less the larger ones that you kind of need to differentiate yourself a little. Um, so yeah, it's it's turning a little bit more towards a traditional build. I think that's helpful, like traditional DFS sport. Um, right. But there's still the flavor that makes this game unique um, and set itself it, apart. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think the big thing to me is that it makes it so that we have so we have less overlap, and I think that's the that's a big problem because we all know we have smaller prize pools than some of the other sports and Mm -hmm. there's so many ties that being able to build unique lineups just makes the competition a lot better makes the sweats better like the payoff when you do hit something is going to be better so i think uh having that kind of difference of build structure is going to be really good for for dfs and the league of legends dfs in general going forward absolutely and we will Hope that this uh, continues to be growing, continues to change, that challenge us so we don't get too comfortable, right? And have everyone knowing how to build the same roster and just split the prize pool, which is one of the more tilting things that happens in these yep. smaller slates. Um, thank you so much for just dropping knowledge of the DFS preparation, how your mindset is, your process. Uh, we really do appreciate the work that you do, and this will help the sports interest grow more. Um, so having said that, let's head in to talk about our LEC and LCS games. Let's do a little review of last week. Um, what stood out to you last week? What, what, how was, how was your weekend? Uh, it was good. The Sunday was really good. Actually. Sunday, yeah. I took fourth in the $8, I think. So it was third or fourth. I was, I was three th- points out of first. <laughs> yeah. I, and it was, it was uh crunched up top. Cause I think you we were like three points behind me, and that was a, a big gap. So it was really tight at the top. But, mm-hmm. uh, one thing that I, I'm starting to toy with that paid off last week was like kind of like we said, leaning into the variance of like 
just any anyone could technically win on any day because it's one uh, one game series. So finding like if this team just happens to win, what's the upside of it? And last week that was clutch gaming for me, where like if they did win, they had a huge kill upside. Even though like I know a lot of people picked them to win, but for me, my model actually didn't like them to win, Ooh. and I just went against it. And I was like, if they do, then they're gonna have the most kills. And same thing with Cloud Nine. And even though they kind of, we weren't sure on their roster, it was like if they did win, they were going to have the most kills. So putting the two of them together, I knew had the highest ceiling, even though if they both lost, you know, it wasn't going to do anything. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good read, man. Because coming into that day, the Sunday, I know a lot of people knew, or at least I advise people to circle the Golden Guardians clutch gaming game because I mentioned in my cheat sheet that you want to be part of this game you don't game stack it but you want to pick the winner of this so i did yeah. a split for uh some of my lineups were goal guardians some of my lineups were clutch gaming but because of be able to play clutch gaming you were able to fit in the c9 guys which again coming into that day people were probably have this bad taste in their mouth because of their substitution that happened the day before and that was where my mentality went because i knew it left a bad taste that I might get an ownership advantage, even if it's like five percent or four percent ownership advantage. Um, yeah, so. I think it. I think Cloud9 scared a lot of people away, and it even scared me because not playing Blabber mm -hmm. cost me because of how bad he had been in the like two starts he had. Yeah, uh, I didn't play him at all, and it cost me because that was the difference between a takedown. Ah, uh, yes, that's right, and. Even and this is the other level, right? When it comes to taking down a GPP, it's not only just picking the right players, picking I mean picking the right team. You have to pick the right players, and even have the players in a certain position, whether you want them in your original spot or captain spot. So it does introduce a lot of um, way to construct a roster, uh, trying to minimize overlap or um, you know roster chopping chopping the prize pool. Yep. And uh, going forward, you're always gonna have this back and forth. You'll never, you're never gonna know, you know, if you made the right decision until after locking when you have this bad feeling. Mm -hmm. You're like, uh, yeah. So yeah, Sunday was was Sunday was actually my only day that I can actually count as a win because I missed cash all the, on the other days. Um, mainly, I had a very poor read in the LEC. Uh, any anything that in the LEC that stood out to you from last week? Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't watch it as much. Yeah. Uh, so, unfortunately, I don't know how much I can add to that one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, but did you have a good result? Uh. Uh, yeah. I I wasn't. Uh, I mean, it was kind of a chalky one, right? Because GP two mm -hmm. and Vitality one, Spice one, like most of the favorites one. Mm -hmm. But I think that I think the best part of it is that going into this weekend, there's still a ton of stuff for all the teams to play. For. For, which makes it a lot better than even the LCS one was, where we were all kind of trying to guess the motivation of everyone. Yeah. But almost everyone in the LEC, besides like three teams, have something to play for this week. And even the ones that, I know we'll get into it, but even the ones that aren't, mm -hmm. that don't have anything to play for, are going against teams that definitely have something to play for. Absolutely. And that is a great segue into previewing this week. DK has released the salaries for LEC and LCS. Uh, they're both up. And this gives us a good time to start talking about um, finding values or talking about which games might interest us. Uh, heading into Friday, we are only able to talk about day one for uh, LEC uh, since they only released the, uh, the salaries for day two after the games have locked for day one. But for <laughs> LCS, we have the full weekend to uh, kind of consider. So looking into day one, what are some things that stood out to you when we look at over the salaries, when you look over the matchups? Um, the biggest surprise to me was that when I did this basically based off the most damage efficient, like gold into damage, and surprisingly, it's saying that A is going to be Vitality, which doesn't take into consideration, like, their strategy level, mm -hmm. but just based on, like, ability to lay down as much damage on the champions, SK looks like they actually have a puncher's chance against Vitality, who is, who has to win to keep their top four spot. So. Yeah, and 
this is a good uh, thing that you brought in because as I looked over all the matchup, SK and Vitality are priced very similarly, very closely, and Vitality being the favorite, naturally, based on recent forms, you kind of have to take it, have to consider Vitality being the favorites coming into this game. But SK right. um, finally broke their losing streak. Is that right? Yes, they finally broke their losing streak. Came against Misfit. That was one read where I went wrong because I went, I was on the Misfit side last week. Um, and SK has something to prove. But you also mentioned that Vitality is they have to win every single matchup just to get into the playoffs. Uh, at this point, yeah. Um, does your research show like this game being a high pace game high kill what what does it show besides the high damage if mm -hmm. if sk wins they should be a big value mm. it, it, right now it's predicting 16 kills for them mm. which if they're middle of the pack is a is good value yeah. are they, i have to double check are they priced below vitality probably right yes they are so they're so they're the better value i think when it comes especially when it comes to upside mm -hmm. um I was trying to look at the kills for win. Yeah. SK don't get a lot of kills for win, but Vitality do lose, do die quite a bit. They have like 18 deaths per loss, mm. which just means that SK does have a high ceiling, even though they have a really low floor too. Absolutely. And this is all predicated on the early game. And here is where I'm going to draw some information trying to uh, extrapolate some information from is sk as this casters mentioned they play a similar style to origin and so i would go back to the first time sk and vitality play each other but that was a long time ago and the patch was different so the most recent uh, information i have is to look into how um, macro focus team like origin or fanatic or splice play against vitality that's where i'm going to um, kind of use those that information. Now, can Vitality? Vitality has to win in an early game in order to win this matchup. They have to be in control. They have to be able to um, set the tone. Otherwise, uh, come late game, they might not be um, organized enough of this team, yeah. as you know, organized yeah. enough to beat a macro focus team. Uh, so the chance is there. I really like this. I really like this. I, I I just had a chance to look over the salary, and this makes the most sense if we were to predict an upset. SK would be the first one to come. Uh, any of the other games that stood out to you for the, uh, for this day one? Um, the spy, uh, the spice uh, origin one is going to be mm. big, both for the teams and trying to figure out how they're going to going to play it, just because. Both teams desperately need that one too. Uh, Splice less because they're probably going to make playoffs either way, mm. but um, they have a chance to jump Fnatic if for some reason Fnatic goes 0-2 or something and they go 2-0 and this weekend. Mm -hmm. So they're really going to want that win to try and get the buy. And Origin is going to be in desperation mode. So is it going to be like uh, CLG last week where we thought it might be, like most people thought it might be low kill and it ended up being kind of okay or is it going to be both teams backing off and just trying not to lose oh that's a good point to bring was that the clg tsm game or was that the day one? yeah I, uh, let me see which one it was okay. but yeah i don't know if yeah i can pull, pull that ahead well. i think it was clg that like had the through oh it was first 100 100 thieves that uh, thieves, supposedly a slow game. it was the Maybe it was Clutch Hunter Thieves. Clutch. I, I might be confused, but I oh, but maybe I know CLG like Optics. <laughs> CLG yeah. Optics is one of the games that we did talk yeah, about. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's the one. Yeah. That we thought they were going to be a little more uh, conservative a lot in their losses, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, we thought mm -hmm. a lot of people thought they might be more reserved, mm -hmm. and they weren't, and C CLG took it to them. Now this will be interesting. Uh, in my so, initial, it's kind of that's the game theory side of it. Yeah, in my initial approach coming into this, this was the game that I had the least interest because I wasn't thinking in the same way that you think uh, were thinking about. Because both teams love to scale up, love to just you know do nothing for a good ten minutes of the game. But that's not to say that they will do so in this game because both teams have shown 
at times to be a little bit more active, be a little bit going a little bit more for the either the sk uh, skirmishes or team fights. Uh, but this game was likely to head into uh, you know beyond 35 minutes, which is when the splice buff um, power spike comes right. in. Right. Uh, so maybe I need to take a pause and look back into this game. Now, uh, the other reason why I overlooked this game is the rest of the schedule. We're looking at heavy favorites. G2 against Rogue. Fnatic against S XL. Schalke against Misfits. Misfits is, you know, yeah, they were exciting for a good two weeks where they went 1-1 one and one and beating Fnatic, beating, um, I forgot which teams <laughs> that they beat. And they were fairly high scoring in their wins, right? Uh Coming last week, they lost both of their games and lost in an incredibly terrible fashion where the opponent team was breaking slates or close to breaking slates, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that was one reason why I overlooked the Spice Origin game. Now, do, uh, do you have a sense of what are these other games go as in as the, uh, the ones that I talked about? The Schalke, Misfit, Fnatic XL, and G2 Rogue. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Oh yeah, no problem. So, do you do you have any um, anything to kind of? Um, so, what is your sense? I'm oh, sorry. So, what is your sense about the Shalka Misfit game? And we'll, then we're gonna touch a little bit on the G two Rogue and uh, G two Rogue and Fnatic XL. I think uh, one thing you brought up that's uh, interesting is that when Misfits do win, which is rare, but when they do score really well mm -hmm. so they have to get bloody in order to win which is usually a lot of bad teams are like that where just they have to maul the other team so that they get so far ahead they can't possibly lose mm -hmm. um and uh if so and you know no one's going to play them so if you're thinking just a dfs strategy wise there's gonna be almost no ownership and they actually have the second highest kills per win in the entire lec mm -hmm. Again, small sample size, but the opportunity's there for them if they do yeah, pull off the upset. Absolutely. I don't think they will, mm -hmm. but I mean, is it worth a shot? For sure. Huh. Uh, this is a young team, and we can't... Like you mentioned, small sample size because they've been only playing together for three weeks. So that's a total of six games with this Academy roster. And this looks like a... At least, it looks like a more exciting Misfit roster than the old Misfit roster. Um, yeah. What is their uh, death per loss? Uh, it is seventeen point eight. So they're in top five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're fifth. So that game, either side of <laughs> either side of that game, actually could score pretty well. Yeah, and I'll be thinking, considering game stack as a possibility, but I don't think you'll need to, just because of. Um, other games that could the winners where the winners could just be equally as high scoring uh, well anything else on the lec before we move to the lcs let me see i don't think i don't think so the the xl fanatic game is interesting because mm -hmm. fanatic has to win and when i when i say that like i don't again i don't think uh, xl would win but there's some some little advantages where there's a stat that i use that gelati told me about which is basically how fast can you convert gold into damage mm. and uh where is it jeskla mm -hmm. and uh uh where is it mickey actually outpace their counterparts on fanatic when it comes to turning gold into damage mm. so if for some reason they have an amazing early game which is the biggest problem is all this gold differential stuff that they have like they have a huge gold gap, but mm. if for some reason they have an amazing early game, they can turn it into enough damage to take out the other team. So, and Fnatic have dropped some weird games this split. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You so just... XL yeah, and XL just had like one or two upsets, I think. Right? They just had one like two weeks ago where they they beat Miss. Uh, they pulled it off. Let me see. I can pull off like the XL schedule, like you mentioned. Another. T yeah. Fnatic just. Randomly drops a game against Misfit. Randomly drops a game game against uh, who was it last week? It was just out of my, you know, out of out of my 
outcome, predicted outcome for them to lose to. Uh, who did they lose to? Fnatic lost to. Well, G2 was not so much, but the Misfit loss was tilting. And then two weeks ago, they lost to. Let me see. They lost to Rogue. Rogue. That's right. They pulled this weird um, roster swap with Magic Felix and moving Nemesis to the ADC. That was That's a disaster. What, they dropped like three out of four because they lost to Splice, then they lost to Rogue, mm. then they won. Yep. And then they lost to Misfits again. Yeah. Okay, so XL is coming in with a win against Splice, which was way outside my prediction for that for yes for last week. I forgot completely. Yeah. I tried. I think I blocked that game out of my mind. Because I was so confident in Splice. <laughs> they were severely underpriced for a top three team at that time. And yet they dropped the game. Of course, uh, following that, uh, things came back to normality when Vitality just run through them with 20 kills. But yes, Fnatic mm -hmm. has the potential to drop games when you least expect it. Yeah, I think that's like... those When you see bad teams, like it's good to know what are the actual good pieces. Mm-hmm. They could they could carry a game, like we like last night, v, Vici Gaming almost upset because Puff just went nuts, mm -hmm. and you could see the same thing in one of these games, uh, where someone just carries the game, gets super fed, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Fnat, just kind of thinking like, uh, more like a traditional sport, the mentality of looking at Vitality the next day, which is a much bigger game. There's a possibility that they kind of overlook XL, and then if XL punches them in the mouth, they might not bounce back. Oof. Uh, so, I mean, you got to think the mentality of these guys, because most of them are really young. So mm -hmm. these are young guys playing, so they have the potential to have fall into a trap game like you see in a lot of other sports. Right. You remember when you were 17, 18, 19? It's just like being carried yeah. by the emotions. Never uh, looking where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and sometimes we may forget that we as adults looking into these lists like why you're supposed to be professionals, you're supposed to do this X, Y, and Z, but they're they're kids, they're really just kids. Um, but yeah, that's a great point to bring up, and I likely have the Excel stack as a very contrarian. It frees up a lot of salaries if you try to stack the Excel. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to get G two versus Rogue, like right. you can use excel mm -hmm. and you can get like a mid or adc in your captain spot just exactly with that with that kind of combination wonderful uh it's ex it's an exciting day I, th I think i mentioned this uh lec has a lot of options so let's look into lcs now we are headed into the playoffs lcs is way ahead we have four teams playing this weekend saturday we'll start off with tsm against clutch <laughs> and then sunday we'll have clg against optics these are best of five people so don't forget not best of threes best of fives and it is a two-day slate but um so you have to be mindful that substitution can happen for some of these teams and i'll run through some of the teams that we're looking at i think so far tsm is the one that has utilized their jungler substitution they have three potential viable junglers that they can play and if this pushes beyond a if they cannot sweep Clutch Gaming, there is a potential that they might sub out the jungle because it is a big issue for TSM. Still is a big issue. Um, you you brought up an interesting point, and I'll let you talk about it. What what is it of the about the TSM jungle that you know did or did not stand yeah. out to you? <laughs> it just it doesn't seem to matter. Like, like I don't know how they're rating him because at the beginning of the year, Greg did really well, and they went like three and zero with him. And every time they put in Acadian, they would lose. But they just forced in Acadian, and now they're putting in someone completely different instead of going back to Greg. So I have no, no idea what TSM's seeing that they don't like on Greg. But it must be something really bad because Acadian has struggled, and they won't go back to Greg. Like they've stuck with him for five weeks, I think. Yep. And then the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the split, it was back and forth, one game for Greg, one for Acadian, and now they're going completely different direction. Yeah. Part of it, I think, uh, people mentioned is Greg's um, overperform in the spring. 
and uh, we saw his limitations when it came to Rift Rivals. And so TSM was probably thinking international and decided Acadian might be their better jungler, but as soon as they put him in, the results were inconsistent looking back. And then, so didn't like all of TSM suck at Rift Rivals? <laughs> like, it wasn't yes. just a jungle. The whole uh, team got wiped. So. Yes. I feel like the jungle is like, they're blaming their jungler on, for everything. And it's Broken Blade getting poked out or something like that. And then it's like Acadian's fault that that happened. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It, the funny thing is when they win, when TSM win, the jungle wasn't as big of an impact. I mean, there were a couple of games that, yes, of course, Acadian did was impactful. But most of the times you see TSM win despite their jungle play. And when they lose, the jungle played well, but the rest of the team sucked. So I, I it's it's an issue <laughs> with this team. And and I just learned that this is an ongoing issue for TSM even before this year. It's like a history with them. Uh, last year they had Mike Young, who is now with Fox, and we saw how Mike Young performs. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ish. <laughs> I'll just leave that at that point. Um, I like him as a person. Um, his game might just be more academy. Uh I'm I'm newer to League of Legends, but doesn't he have like some famous game? Yeah, uh, his rookie year he was amazing. Uh, he didn't okay. play for TSM back then, but his rookie year he he made rookie of the, <laughs> rookie of the year. So he was okay. dominant for both spring and summer split. And then after okay. he T, uh, after he went to TSM, it was it was bad. It was, and I don't know if it's a loss of. <laughs> Confidence, or if his skill level is just not LCS um, ready. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the first game. We're, we're talking TSM. We're talking clutch gaming. Now, if you if this was a matchup that presented to me in a regular week, I would think TSM could win easily because clutch gaming is just another team. But over the last few weeks, clutch has shown that they do belong in the playoffs. Uh, they looked uh, like the better team, if I'm not mistaken, last week, that wanted to get into the playoffs. I love Cody's son. Mm -hmm. he's, he's been my best friend this this split. Like, I think for some reason, every time my model likes Clutch Gaming, they do really well, and I do really well. So, And Cody's son, I think, was like such a huge addition for them. He's, a, he's a, actually a pretty good ADC. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and it, it was a whole thing last year. I don't know if you remember or paid attention, but he was on 100 Thieves. So every time they they play 100 Thieves, you know, he is in for the revenge factor. But even outside of those games, every time I watch Clutch when where they're doing well, I, for one, was expecting that it could be a Huni or a Demonte game, but it was actually Cody-san who was doing very well. Yeah. So... If we look match yeah, and even mm -hmm. I remember when the I remember when the split started. Mm -hmm. I remember when the split started, and I did the that same calculation of like turning gold to to damage. He was really high, like mm -hmm. he's super efficient. So when he was on hundred thieves, they just the rest of the team just wasn't beating him right. I guess like clutch is focused on him, and now he's been popping off. They're mm -hmm. still I don't they're still obviously not TL or cloud nine level, but they're they can beat anyone. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, think this game will go? Um, 3-0, 3-1, Silver Scrape? It's got to be... It's got to be... I want to say TSM is still going to win. Mm -hmm. I think experience matters because Clutch is... Uh, isn't, definitely isn't, I don't know, sad to say, as Clutch sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's a good thing. I think it could easily this. go 3-2. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, it could easily go three two because Clutch is gonna put, Clutch is definitely gonna put up a fight, and TSM has been super shaky. So if they don't draft right and have a poor early game, they're done. Like they, unless they backdoor again, like they had to do against Fox. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I think that they, I think they're shaky. Once they're knocked off their game, they they haven't been recovering well. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I'm on the same line as you, uh, but once it reaches to game five, it's anyone's game for myself. Uh, I do think yeah. the experience edge is on TSM's side, and it should be a TSM win, but we, there's the recent form doesn't give me a lot of confidence, especially if they're still rotating their jungler around, right? 
Um, but this is also exactly. important because we're, we're thinking if we're coming in with the mindset that this is going to be uh, I'll go all the way to game five to determine the winner. How do you approach it in terms of uh, how, how do you uh, which side of these two games do you want to be heavier on? What would be, go through your mind? And I'll share a thought about what I'll go, it'll go through my mind. I think I like these teams more because they could go five games because mm -hmm. I don't I think uh, they need all the kills they can get to to pay off because these teams aren't always that bloody although Clutch has had some really bloody games but TSM has that they either win quick they either win like methodically or they don't win at all mm -hmm. so uh, I don't think that they're going to pay off the same way if it only goes three games and then they get the two bonuses. Like I think they need as many kills as possible. So because we think it would go longer, I like it more than I would if I thought one was a heavy favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same idea, what I've noticed over the years and is that when one it hits the game five, and if every game is close, maybe they're all five, five or uh, so kills, the team could score similarly where sometimes even the losing team uh, end up right. having more DFS points, having more D DK points. And so in that sense, you want to be exposed to this game. Uh, you want to stack more of the players from this game. And the bonuses really help the team spot more so than the player spot. Right. Excellent, excellent. So we're in the same train of thoughts. And if you guys like to go contrarian, you might... Uh, decide to do a little thing different than what we're talking about here, but that's that's okay too. But so so far, Ryan and I we are coming in with the same idea. This could be a game five scenario, maybe even a game four scenario. But it, yeah. it's a two evenly matched team, more so than what I thought coming into this split. Anyways, it's gonna be a. I think it's gonna be a tough slate because I think that the word is out that TSM is shaky. Mm -hmm. I think if it was. You know, coming in with the same expectations as the beginning of the split, everyone would be on TSM and Clutch would be a perfect GPP play. They'll probably still be lower owned than TSM, mm -hmm. but people will play them on, like, like you would think last split in the playoffs. It, it would be such much bigger gap. So um, it's going to be an interesting slate because all these teams are pretty evenly matched. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the last thing I'll 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 say about this game is just avoid the TSM jungle if you do think. If you are stacking <laughs> yeah. TS, there is no upside. I mean, maybe they stink anyways. Yeah, maybe they they can sweep with one person, but you do, do you want to take that chance? And even when they're wins, how impactful are their junglers versus the other side? If you pick the winners from the other game and play their jungler, who you're ninety five ninety nine percent guaranteed that they'll play all the all games. Yeah. And I will say that uh, if you're playing CG, Vulcan is one of those supports that I actually really like. Mm, he, all, mm -hmm. when, they pay, you know, when they pay off, he and Cody Sun do damage together. So he definitely has good games. Absolutely. And he's always underpriced. Every slate I looked at him, yep. he's underpriced. Uh, no respect for the man, but yeah, that, that is a good... <laughs> that's a good observation. Uh, we'll talk about our final game of the weekend which will be CLG against Optics. Your thoughts? I really I really hope CLG win. They mm -hmm. sh I think they I think they will. But I, you can't discount uh, Arrow. Mm -hmm. um, and Medios has had a much better split than last, than Spring. Yeah. But I th but CLG just looked really good. I I know they lost to Cloud 9 in the uh, tiebreaker, but they've been the third best team the whole split. Mhm. Mm and I want to see them kind of go deep and try and take out a TL or a C9. Yeah, this is an exciting time for CLG. The, for the past one and a half split, they've been really a disappointment, underperforming, but coming into summer, they look really good. It's a very solid team. Uh, I'm on the same line as you. Does Optic have a chance to upset? Maybe, but it seems like less likely than before. Um, they remind me of... Uh in LPL last last split where it's like they won't die like <laughs> yes. Op 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 Optic won't go away yeah they, they started great 
they stunk for a long time, and then they get into the tiebreaker and they win three games. Like they just. <sighs> and last playoffs, they did the same thing. They went way farther than we all thought, mm-hmm. and just they just won't freaking die. Yep. So this... they they for sure have a chance. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the team that it either cost me money because I bet against them in DFS or when I am on them, they decide not to do anything. They kill yep. me. They kill me. Um, they came in the day knowing that they had to win to get a playoff or they would be um, needing to be rely on other teams to get themselves into the tiebreaker. And they came in super flat Sunday. Really flat. But... They pulled it through in the tiebreakers, um, beat 100 Thieves in a in, in, in convincing fashion that showed me, okay, they got some signs of life, but at, at the end of the day, I'm still not too excited about their prognosis in the playoffs. Right. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time just hanging out uh, and chatting. Uh, draft. Uh, DraftKings, DFS, League of Legends. I hope to have you back uh, some in the future so we can continue sharing our knowledge and continue encouraging others to just play, just give this game a chance. It's a great bankroll builder. Uh, and it's it fun. Is. It's fun because uh, it's still not one of those sports that is covered by a lot of people. So we're learning and we're adapting. Uh, what do you tell absolutely, viewers? Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't you tell viewers where they can find you, where they can hit you up, uh, and where they can find your work? Did we cut off? Uh, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So just tell viewers where they can uh, find you, how they can find your work, uh, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I started a, a DFS site, uh, yourdfsplaybook.com. We're not a just a lineup provider. We do spreadsheets um, to help you pick players and call them the playbook. And I do a playbook for LCS every weekend, um, and I do templates to help you guys build your lineups. Um, otherwise, find me on Twitter, Captain uh, C A P T Morgan D F S, and uh, you know I'll, I'm always down to talk League of Legends. So. Awesome, and. My name is Chris Chung at Primetime on Twitter. This is a feature of the Game House. Thank you for joining us, guys. And you can hit the replay on my Twitch channel, which I will post on my Twitter. Thank you so much, Ryan. No problem. Thanks for having me. That went really well. I like that. <laughs>